When you meditate, you're showing respect for your own mind, respect for its power, and respect for its potentials. The power here is the power to do a lot of good or a lot of evil. In this way, you have to respect your mind the same way that you might respect gunpowder or bomb or missile. There's a potential for a lot of danger that the mind can do. Look at all of the trouble in the world that the human mind has created. So the respect here is tinged with heedfulness in the sense that yeah, there's danger here. But at the same time, there's also a lot of potential good. If you use gunpowder properly or use explosive properly, you can get rid of a lot of things that are getting in the way of progress. It depends on what you blow up and what you don't blow up. That requires a lot of discernment. Respect for the potential here is that the mind has the potential for a lot of good, and it can do things when it's concentrated, when you're mindful, when you have concentration well developed. You can do things you wouldn't imagine otherwise. The Buddha talks about three levels of discernment. There's the discernment that comes from reading and listening. We understand things on one level when we can read them and understand them that way. Then there's another level where you take things and you think them through to see how consistent they are, to see how useful they might be. But then there's the discernment that comes from developing. In other words, you actually develop these qualities in your mind, and that's when you find out what their real potential is. In some cases, that potential can threaten the frame that you have around what you've decided you're going to believe in or you're going to, to follow. But it threatens it in a good way. It shows you that there's a lot more to the mind than you may have thought. So you want to re respect this potential. At the same time, we're respecting our desire for something that's worthy of respect, our desire for true happiness. The happiness doesn't harm anybody, a happiness that's solid, dependable. The only way you're going to find a happiness like that is by looking inside. And the only way you're going to see it inside is if you allow things to settle down. Because otherwise our minds are like a bottle of salad dressing. There's the oil and there's the vinegar, and when it's shaken up, it's all mixed together. You can't see, the, see clearly which part is the oil, which part is the vinegar, but you let it sit still for a while, and things begin to separate out on their own. It's the same as we sit here and meditate. We bring everything together and then allow it to settle down. And as it settles down, you begin to see there are different layers to the mind, different layers to the stillness of the mind, and different things going on in here that we tend to glom together. In the area of the body, we tend to glom our pains onto our physical sense of the body. So say there's a pain in your knee or a pain in your ankle. The pain in the ankle and the pain in the knee tend to be, seem to become the same thing. But if you sit still with these things long enough, you begin to see, okay, the body is made out of a sense of solidity and liquid and warmth and energy. And the pain is none of those. The pain is something else. It flits around. And when you can see the distinction, makes it a lot easier to live with the pain. The same with the mental tr troubles we create for ourselves. We tend to tie things together. We have all kinds of stories we can create. Several people over the past couple of days have been talking about suddenly remembering embarrassing things they did in the past. It just kind of pops up into the mind and then you grab onto it. We have to learn how to take these things apart, take apart the thought that's popped up and take apart the act of grabbing on. And you begin to see there are 
made out of things that are not all that solid. There's the form of the body, where the mind and the body meet, and there's a little stirring right there. And that stirring could either be interpreted as a physical event, i.e. it's a, an issue in the breath energy, or it's a mental event. And once you think it's a mental event, then you place a label on it and it becomes a thought about this, that, or the other thing. And through association, or sometimes just sh through sheer randomness, a thought of the past will come up. What's it made out of? It's made out of there are the feelings there, and there's the picture you hold for yourself, and there's a story you tell yourself around it. Those are feelings and perceptions and fabrications. And we glom them all together and it turns into a narrative with an, an emotional coloring. But you can take that apart. If you see that it's causing you suffering, take it apart and say, oh, that's just a perception, that's just a fabrication, that's just a feeling. And that's all. Just think of it as, it's just that and it's that all. That's all. There's nothing more that you have to make out of it. In other words, you've got to clear these things away by dividing them up into little bits and pieces. And seeing that's what they originally are, that we've glommed these things together and they get in the way of our being able to settle down and have a sense of clarity here in the present moment. And you begin to see also how the mind creates a lot of unnecessary suffering for itself. I mean, we already have enough suffering as it is with having to deal with a body that ages and grows ill and is eventually going to die. Knowing that we're going to have to be separated from all the people and the things that we love. That right there is enough to suffer from, but then we add on top of it all kinds of unnecessary stuff. And that gets in the way of our understanding ourselves and understanding the potentials of the mind. That there really is a potential here inside for a happiness that's deathless, that's not affected by anything at all. Aging, illness, death, separation, whatever. None of those things can touch the happiness that is possible inside. The sense of well-being that lies deeper than anything conditioned. But to find that, you have to clear away a lot of the stuff we've plastered on top of. A lot of the stuff we hold on to it pretty, pretty dearly. It's like knowing that you have to move, and you're going to have to move quickly. And you go through the house and it's just everything seems to be something you want to hold on to, something that has some meaning, something that has some emotional ties. If you let all your emotional ties hold you down, you've got to put everything in the house in a big bag over your shoulder, and you never get anywhere. There are certain things we've got to give up if we want to find true happiness. And it turns out that once you've found the true happiness, you look on the things you gave up and they don't have any worth at all. The problem is, is that they have worth now for us because that's all we, all we have. As the Buddha pointed out, sometimes you can have just very meager belongings, but you can be really attached to them, as much as someone has really fine belongings. There's nothing objective about the things that makes them more or less worth holding on to. It's our, all the emotional coloring we give to them. So to find a happiness that's really worthy of respect, we have to sort through our own minds and see what we have to get let go of, and learn how to let go with a sense of not regretting the fact that we're letting go, seeing that the things we've been holding on to really aren't worth all that much to begin with. The image in the canon is of a person who's blind, and someone playing a trick on him says, here's a wonderful white cloth that's really clean and really nice and you look really good carrying it around, but it's a greasy old rag. But the blind person carries it around, thinking he's got this wonderful, valuable piece of cloth. And then it so happens that his friends and relatives find a doctor who's really good and can cure him of his blindness. So the first thing he does, he looks at the cloth and he realizes it's a greasy rag. He realizes he's been fooled.
sort of throws it away. No matter how much he held on to it, no matter how she valued it before, once he sees that it's not worth what he thought it was, you throw it away. You have to realize that the value of the mind is something worthy of a lot of respect. And the potentials of the mind are worthy of a lot of respect. So we have to ask, what are we showing more respect for in terms of our greed or our aversion or our delusion? Why do we respect these things so much? They provide their pleasures, but we tend to turn a huge blind eye to their drawbacks. Even when we admit their drawbacks, there's part of the mind that just is not willing to let go. As the Buddha said, to see through these things, you have to see their drawbacks, but you also have to see what their allure is. What is it that attracts you to them? Part of you may not like your anger, but there's a part of you that does. Part of you may not like your greed, but there's a part of you that does. You want to ferret out that part that does. Because that's a part of the mind that's getting in the way of the potential of what the mind can really do. It's dragging you down. One of the reasons we show so much respect for the Buddha and the Dharma the Sangha around here is because they teach us to respect something that's really worth of respect, worthy of respect in ourselves. One, the potential of the mind. And two, the mind's desire for true happiness. A happiness is blameless, a happiness that's solid. These things really are worthy of respect. So we respect not only in showing physical respect and thinking respectful thoughts, but actually by doing the work of cleaning out the garbage of the mind, and cutting through all the little strings we've tied around ourselves. So we can finally see that the mind really is something that has the power and the potential to provide that happiness that we want, and the happiness that's worthy of respect. As the Buddha said, it's blameless. Not only blameless, it's really something worth bowing down to. They tell stories of the Ajans who, on attaining full awakening, just get up and just bow down. Realizing all the trouble the Buddha went to find this truth and to pass it along, and all the people who have passed it along from him. When you realize what they went through, but at the same time what they have to offer, that's the spontaneous response. Respect.